Hello again, and welcome to Canto 14, Canto Xiv, Canto XIV, as they say in Roman numerals. Uh, Canto 14. Uh, we're still in the seventh circle of hell, and uh, we're but we're entering the third part, the third girone of the uh, seventh circle, and um, this is a flat, uh, uh, fairly wide circle if you look at the diagram I'll, I'll hand you a, a better copy than we have in our book of the uh, of this uh, seventh circle um, the first part is the river Phlegathon the second part is the forest uh, that we've already seen and now we're coming to this sandy plain uh, and uh, where the fire rains down um, and there he sees three groups of sinners uh, the one laying down uh, supine, the blasphemers, another one bent over, these are the usurers, and finally the wanderers, these are the uh, the sodomites. Uh, suddenly they, uh, this fire rains down on them all over that sand land, line 28. A fall of slowly raining broad flakes of fire showered steadily, a mountain snowstorm on a windless day. Uh, and then he gives a lengthy, uh, or at least three terset um, uh, epic simile uh, describing it and then Dante sees this giant uh, now we've talked in the last videos about um, the the tendency of Dante to um, to give us uh, to intertwine the uh, the pagan classical with the uh, Christian and or judeo-christian and Capaneus was uh, one of the uh, seven against Thebes. Um, he was uh, the leader of one of the seven armies. Uh, this was the greatest battle before, a generation before uh, the generation of the uh, Trojan War, which in turn uh, was a generation that uh, it, classical writers looked back on as the last great generation, and we've fallen in... Um, moral stature since then. But Dante's point here is that it's not just moral stature, that it is uh, physical stature. Uh, he believed that if uh, if it were possible to go back in time, uh, we would have to look up to see a hero like uh, Achilles or uh, Capaneus. And uh, and so Capaneus is a giant, and, and his sin is blasphemy and uh, really a kind of arrogance, a kind of arrogance that goes beyond the arrogance of Farinata, because this is an arrogance against God, that you think that you can stand up to God, because Capaneus did. Um, he was struck down by a thunderbolt uh, from Giove, uh, G-I-O-V-E in Italian, but that, that we recognize that as the name of Jove uh, uh, as he was worshipped uh, by the Romans. We saw that name Jove or Jupiter in uh, the Aeneid. And, um, and the, in the, the medieval mind saw a connection, even though there's no etymological connection uh, uh, but they believed there was a connection between uh, the Tetragrammaton, the, uh, the, the traditional Hebrew name of uh, uh, Yahweh or Jehovah as it is um, uh, modernized. That's not the way it was pronounced in, uh, in Hebrew, but it was, uh, it was thought uh, by some uh, uh, Europeans later to, uh, to have been a pronunciation. And so that... Um, that more clearly sounds like Jove, and so um, uh, so in shaking his fist uh, at the, the thunderbolt that struck him down, the, the way Captain Dan does in Forrest Gump, um, he is, or as Ahab does in uh, uh, the other the other nautical tale, um, Melville's uh, uh, Moby Dick. Um, he shows that hubris, that uh, uh, that arrogant uh, defiance of uh, Giove, uh, that is uh, is typical of the modern uh, defiance, and so his, his pride is what brought him down. Pride goeth before a fall. Um, they come to a stream, and Virgil tells them that the source of the stream is this ancient statue in uh, uh, in Crete. Uh, of an old figure who is weeping and the, the tears uh, trickle down and uh, uh, trickle into hell and form all of the rivers of hell. That leads us to Canto Xiv, um, uh, XV. Um, this is the third round of the 
uh, seventh circle. So they're still in the seventh circle, but the th third Girone, and uh, that is the circle of the Sodomites. Okay. Um, once again, as before with the heretics, uh, we said that Dante has a tendency to um, to uh, do something special for uh, uh, for sins to which he doesn't have a personal connection. Okay, he is not tempted by heresy, so he uh, so among the heretics uh, he has somebody like Farinata. Uh, who would have a political connection with Dante, or uh, Cavalcante, who would have a poetic connection with Dante, um, come and uh, and greet him. And so that's how he personalizes it uh, when he comes to a sin that, that has no personal connection for Dante. And so for Dante, then, it is his beloved tutor, uh, Brunetto Latini, uh, who was a great, who, who Dante thought as, as, as a great poet, a great teacher, and uh, uh, an immensely moral man, except for this overriding sin of uh, homosexuality. And uh, so he, um, he finishes Canto uh, XV 15 with uh, his praise for Latino, and we move on, uh, continuing to the third round, uh, well, this is still the third round of the seventh circle in Canto 16. Uh, Dante stopped by these three souls, one of whom recognizes him, this time not by his voice, but uh, you remember when Farinata recognizes Dante by his accent, um, but now these guys rep recognize Dante by his garb. Okay, now in, uh, in modern days, um, of course, we look at... Uh, uh, paintings of uh, people of these times, and they all look the same to us, or at least they do to me, but then, of course, I have no fashion sense. Why else would I wear these uh, red suspenders? Uh, and so, um, these, uh, in, in these older days, however, the, uh, the shadows, the shades, recognize Dante by his uh, Florentine outfits, that somehow uh, this or that article of uh, clothing or the way that it's worn uh, is recognizably Florentine, that this guy is uh, from Firenze. Um, and so the, the Florentines uh, uh, introduce themselves. Uh, uh, there's uh, Guido Guerra and uh, Tegaio Aldobrandi and Jacopo Rostacucci. Uh, and these, um, uh, these guys who uh, actually, we can follow. We can find, scholars have found out their uh, identities largely because they were recorded in the uh, um, in the uh, the Inferno, and and that's true of a lot of uh, minor uh, Florentines and other people that Dante uh, uh, met. Uh, scholars uh, comb through all of the old records, and partly because uh, the society in uh, uh, 13th century Italy was so partisan the way that uh, we we meet Dante's life um, with everybody conspiring against uh, everybody else. Uh, massive records would survive and in fact uh, uh, we are able to identify a lot of these people who otherwise uh, would not would never have been remembered. Dante reaches out to embrace them, but then stops. Uh, it's not quite the same as um, when uh, Aeneas tries to embrace his father Anchises, or when, uh, uh, when in uh, in Virgil's source in uh, the Odyssey, where Odysseus uh, tries in vain to embrace his mother. Uh, it's uh, here. It's it's thinking better of it. He reaches out, but then he says, "Oh no, uh, I'll burn up." And so um, he regrets to tell these uh, sinners that uh, uh, Florence is not as virtuous as it was uh, in their day. Uh, and so they uh, they make it to the edge of um, of the seventh round which turns out to be a huge waterfall. The, all of this water dropping down that uh, Virgil was describing is now an immense waterfall because the, the distance to the next level, so far we go down from level to level and it, you, know, you just have to ease yourself down. 
But now it's a huge chasm. The distance between uh, the seventh circle and the eighth circle is immense, and they have no idea uh, how they're going to make it. But then, um, uh, at the end of the canto and going on to canto uh, 17, uh, we see a giant monster who turns out to be the giant, the three-bodied and three-headed giant Garion, uh, who's a winged creature in hell. And uh, they, in, and so we're into uh, canto 17 now. He flies them down. And now behold the beast with the pointed tail, says the opening line of canto 17. That repulsive spectacle of fraud, line 7. Uh, his face was the face of any honest man, uh, line 10. It shone with such a look of benediction, and all the rest of him was serpentine. Um, so they fly down then to the uh, eighth uh, level, which is the, uh, the, the circle of the usurers. Um, Dante sees a purse around the neck of every uh, shade there. Of course, they're usurers. They always want uh, uh, money nearby. Um, and uh, we get a description of the, uh, um, of the descent itself, and Garion sets them down at the end of Canto 17, which leads us to Canto 18. So we can finish uh, our readings for today in, uh, in this video. Okay. Uh, in the eighth circle, um, there uh, we, again we've gone down this very steep uh, slope, and the this uh, uh, circle is called Malebolga. Uh, a bolgia is the is the word for one of these um, one of these spirals, one of these uh, cuts in the uh, uh, the rock. Um, so Malebolga would be the the bad uh, bolgia. Um, these are the ten ravines. Uh, and each of these ravines, each of these bolga, uh, has a different kind of sinner uh, uh, in it. Uh, and this time, we see demons whipping these uh, uh, sinners. And um, uh, these uh, turn out to be panderers and seducers. Two different, um, two different sides, two different ways in which sinners uh, are connected with the sin of adultery. The seducers, of course, the one who causes adulterer, adultery by convincing someone otherwise trying to be virtuous uh, uh, into giving in to adultery. That's the seducer. Uh, the panderer uh, is an interesting name that comes from a character that you have, uh, have met. Uh, Pandaros, uh, we saw him in, uh, actually in both of the, uh, both in uh, Homer and in Virgil. Um, uh, in Homer, he unfortunately was the one who uh, was uh, tricked by uh, Athena into breaking the truce by firing the bow. He was known as the greatest uh, bowman, the greatest archer of the uh, uh, of the Trojans. Okay. But he's better known in Dante's time for another error, not for cheating on um, uh, the uh, it, on the on a truce, uh, but allowing his niece. Uh, now, if you remember the the starting of the uh, the problem with the Iliad was uh, uh, in book one was um, the the fact that Agamemnon had stolen uh, part of one of his war prize was the uh, uh, the young girl uh, uh, Chryseis the daughter of uh, Chryses, the, uh, the prophet. Okay. Well, she is this very beautiful uh, Trojan uh, uh, in the later stories, and we develop a whole, um, a whole story about Chryseis uh, in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, in, in, according to this story, she falls in love with a Trojan warrior named Troilus, uh, and her uncle is Pandarus. And so Pandarus, the uncle, the brother then of Chryses, um, Pandarus uh, allows her to meet secretly with Troilus. So, in other words, uh, he he becomes a kind of a to to be harsher about it, as if as if he were intending to um, uh, to help her his his niece uh, lose her virtue. Um, uh, that's where the word pander comes from. Pander as a, a kind of a uh, um, 
pimp, basically, is, is what it means. Somebody who uh, allows adultery to happen, who, uh, who, who a, a go-between, who brings lovers together. Um, so that's who the panderers are. And so uh, Virgil points out some of the more famous uh, seducers, like Jason, who seduced uh, uh, Medea, uh, and Hypsipyle. Uh, we know less about Hypsipyle than we do about Medea. Everybody remembers the story of his seduction of Medea. Medea was the daughter of his enemy, uh, but she helps him to, uh, uh, to win out. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that, that takes us to the end of Canto um, uh, 18, and before we get to Canto uh, 6, uh, that is XIX, that is 19, um, well, that'll be uh, in class on Thursday. So uh, I'll talk to you about that then. So thank you for uh, this whirlwind tour of uh, Canto's, where did we start uh, with this uh, with this video? Canto's 14 through 18. Uh, you've been very attentive, and uh, uh, thank you for being with us, and uh, I'll see you in class on Thursday. God bless you.